Uh, you were listening to Playing for Change, and now you are listening to Live from the Heartland. I'm Michael James here with Tom Clark, and we are really honored to have uh, one of our favorite political women, po political p p person in general. She is the state representative from the 14th District of the great state of Illinois. She is the one, the only Kelly Cassidy. Good morning to you. Good morning, y'all. <laughs> Well, it's great job uh, picking you up, getting some coffee, driving down here, talking about all kind of stuff that we probably won't talk about on the air. And, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great way to start a Saturday morning. That's good. Now, we understand that uh, your time is limited, even though we're going to all be here together until close to 10 o'clock, because you have uh, some great sporting event that you have to get to, and we are in charge of getting you there you in are. time. It's very important. Uh, my, my middle guy, Daniel, is pitching in the Loyola Park All-Stars baseball game today. And uh, he is happiest when on the mound, and I'm happiest when he's happy. So it's super fun to watch him pitch. He had a no hitter last weekend, which is amazing wow. at Little League. Wow! Um, it was a, it had a shutout, so it wasn't just that he, you know, they didn't just walk him all home. Um, do, do his brothers come and watch him? Most of the time, yeah, yeah. They, the oldest is not a baseball fan at all, so it's a little harder to get him to go. Um, Ethan likes to go and watch and then critique everybody. He's he's like the king of the statisticians, so literally walking home from the park with them, he will be talking to Daniel about who hit off him and how who the other who what other pitchers hit that kid is able to hit off of. I mean it's actually a little bit like, you know, maybe raising a young Theo Epstein. <laughs> how, how old is Daniel? Thir he's twelve. He's gonna be thirteen this year. And how big a guy is he? He he's getting big. He's he's gotten tall. He's he's about 5'2", and he's got a little beef behind him. And this uh, this is at Loyola Park? Yeah. yeah. I had some, I have great memories of uh, three of my kids growing up and playing in those leagues over there. Not only base, baseball, but the basketball yeah. in, in the wintertime. Yeah. It's a wonderful park. It Mary is, Hopkins Mary is there is running Mary is amazing. It. She's also my neighbor, um, but she is amazing. The boys are also in summer camp at Loyola Park, and they love it there. They've got friends that, you know, they see regularly, you know, between baseball and, and, and camp, and they just love it there. It's great. So I hate to move into serious stuff right away off of such a... Yeah, I like it. He likes the serious you stuff. You do like moving into the serious stuff. <laughs> what was it like the evening after you had to pull your son off the field because of something that happened a few weeks ago? Um, it, it was a little otherworldly, you know. I mean, we all live in Rogers Park. We know what gunfire sounds like. We've all experienced it. Um, yeah, we spit sit around and say, is that a firecracker right, or a gun? Right, right, exactly, gun. exactly. <laughs> Um, but, you know, it, it, but we say that as if our neighborhood's a war zone, and it isn't. Um, it's just that it's not unfamiliar to us. Um, having it interrupt a baseball game just sort of, it crossed the line for me in a way that um, didn't really sink in until later. You know, when it's happening, we're all being herded into the field house. There are kids whose parents aren't there. I, had, I ended up taking a kid home until we could find his mom. Um, you know, so in that moment, you're just getting everybody where they need to be. Um, and it was only later that I was like, I, I was frankly furious. You know, this was. This where, where, was how close were the shots? Were they up over by the basketball court? Or? No, they were. So it was basically from um, the the shots were coming from across the street towards someone who was standing on the other corner, um, and then ran towards the fields. So, you know, they started on the corner by the field house essentially, yeah. and then you know he came closer to. That would to where be we were. Uh, Greenleaf and Sheridan. Yes. Yeah. So well, the kids in the dugout actually, you know, they saw it happening. You know, I was up in the stands, so I just heard it. I didn't see it. But the kids that were playing actually heard it, turned, and saw the folks running away. So what kind of a conversation do you have with your 12-year-old ace pitcher after? You know, in, frankly, in some ways, no different than every conversation I've had with them. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm a weirdo, but I... You so. are, but we love you. <laughs> I mean, I, I have very frank conversations with my kids um, as if they're... Adults, you know, I, I don't mince words with them. I never have, and and so you know they know the work I've done on gun violence. They know the work I've done around you know funding violence prevention and supporting violence prevention efforts in, in neighborhoods like ours and others. Um, they know my theories behind you know what's driving this. They understand um, really fundamentally that you know this is it, it's it's not a simple problem to solve that. You know, the only thing that is in unlimited supply in neighborhoods is guns and, and black and brown men without hope. And that, that's what we have to solve. It's not an incarceration problem. It's not a, uh, you know, war punishment problem. It is a, you know, 
create opportunity and, and re restore neighborhoods and restore hope issues. So they get that. You know, so, so when something like that happens, they also wonder about the people that were involved in it. You know, they, they don't dismiss them as inhuman. They wonder what was going on in their lives. Did, did they know any of them? No. They, they didn't recognize I'm them anyway. I'm real impressed with what Harry Olsterman has been doing, particularly through SEND and engaging youth in a variety of levels from just trying to find those basic summer jobs to a lot of during the school year, after school activities and stuff on weekends. How do we encourage more of that kind of stuff, particularly with so many agencies still recovering from just a terrible two years in terms of state funding? Well, I mean, it's no coincidence that this spike in violence began at the exact moment that we stopped paying our bills. It, I mean, it's that, it, 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 it actually can be that simple. Ironic cause and effect. Though. Exactly, exactly. That's um, I've never heard anyone say that. Uh, maybe they do, but uh, you know, the gun violence has risen substantially since the state of Illinois has not had a budget. Yeah. And stopped paying okay. bills to and at its community most, service groups, et right. cetera, et cetera. So at its most basic, you know, we stopped funding the violence prevention program. So that's the most direct correlation. Right? Those were cut off instantly. Um, but we also stopped funding social services. We stopped funding youth jobs. We stopped funding after school programs. Like all of the things that help to mitigate the circumstances that lead to these problems have been, you know, either nibbled to death or eliminated completely. And, you know, so it is my hope now that we finally have a budget that does put funding back into these things that we can start to dig out of this hole and, and start to, to, you know, get caught back up. I, you know, we, we've seen a, I think it's a 14% drop this year in, in violent, uh, in shooting incidents, but that, that's contrasted to a 50% spike last year, right? So, you know, we're even that 14% that drop doesn't get us back to ground zero, right? It just starts to undo that, that huge increase. Now, you're enough of a policy want to know that the year-to-year -year crime stats are a terrible way They're to track horrible. this problem. Yep. And so I'm not going to go there. Right. Um, I'm willing to but look it's at what five we have. or ten years. But it it's is what a we point have. of reference. Yeah. Um, but it's terribly imperfect, mm -hmm. even as you get into how uh, law enforcement collects those stats. Absolutely. And how different cases get treated certain ways. Yep. Um, but putting uh, putting all that aside. Because we could spend all day on that. Because you are a policy. And then no one else stuff. would be listening. It would be just us. Um, <laughs> you have had success in convincing an otherwise um, unsupportive governor on, on certain things the state ought to be doing. You've been very successful in getting him to agree to certain basic reforms in our criminal justice system and even in this terrible budget battle you got some more stuff done. Can you talk about some of the new initiatives that you managed to get through this very divided General Assembly? Sure, I, I will say that you know criminal justice reform has been our sweet spot, right? That's the place where we can find agreement and given that that's my primary focus um, or a major focus of mine, um, I have had some success, and, and this year in particular, one that I'm incredibly proud of, and I'm waiting for him to sign it, and I hope he does, uh, is a, a bill that will change what might be one of the dumbest laws I've ever seen, and that's saying something. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a law in the books that specifically is specifically aimed at people on probation and parole um, that creates a new felony offense for... Um, being in the company of a known street gang member. Oh, right. That's terrible. Um, which to me suggests you can't go home, frankly, because that's all it is. Right? Like, we're sending people back into communities, sometimes back into homes, with other, quote, documented street gang members. And let's, again, we could go down that road too, but we won't. Um, but, you know, it, it, is the, it is the epitome of setting someone up for failure. So I set, I set about last year to try to repeal it completely, um, ran into some resistance from, from conservatives and Republicans specifically, but um, ended up uh, coming back at it this year by um, amending it to require that you be engaged in activities in furtherance of gang activity. Um, passed it with a huge bipartisan support, got a lot of great support from the media, uh, worked a lot with McDunkey on some stories around it, around sort of the, the ridiculousness of these. Um, you know, I had one, I, the, the original thing that led me to start pushing for this was seeing a police report of a guy who was arrested after a traffic stop, and again, it was, you know, tail light, what, some license Minor. plate light, yeah. Um, traffic stop, 
You know, John Doe was being driven to work by Bill Doe, his brother, a documented street gang member. John Doe is on parole, therefore in violation of this statute. He was doing exactly what we want him to be doing. He was going to work. Like, by the, in the cop's own words, he was going to work. Do we talk about cops who are documented torturers? <laughs> <laughs> and whether or not they're allowed to go home or not? Is that, I'm sorry. That. Just, uh, that's good. There is that. So we're waiting for a signature on that. Um, and, you know, other than the budget, I've spent a lot of time working on cannabis reform this year and trying to get that teed up and ready to go. Um, and hopeful. Well, I know we've got to talk about the budget, but I want to go with the cannabis reform since you just mentioned it. Um, and uh, why don't we start with uh, your earliest exposure to cannabis? Uh, because <laughs> I know you tell a, a good story about as a kid growing up on an island in the Gulf Coast that exactly. uh, there was uh, there were. You tell the story. Yeah. What would happen? <laughs> well, you know, when when people ask me about it and you know like why I care or whatever, I mean, it, I, I care for a whole lot of policy reasons too. But I grew up in a place where it was fairly normalized. Um, you know, you grew up on a barrier island on the Gulf Coast in the 70s, you're going to see pot. It's just that simple. Um, and, and what Michael's referring to is, uh, you know, periodically you would hear that a bale had washed up on the beach and everybody would run down to try to find it because, you know, some fisherman had tossed it over rather than get boarded by the Coast Guard. Um, which also leads to why I am not a big seafood eater in the Midwest, because we always <laughs> knew, you, you wanted to... You wanted to be sure whose boat the fish came off of, because um, if you're if you're eating in a restaurant that bought off of the wrong boat, that catch could have been r riding around for a little bit longer because it was a cover for their real load. Um, so I, I tend to be very picky about fish. I need to know who the fisherman is. And with that, I have to do a quick plug for the neighbor <laughs> and a growing enterprise in, in Rogers Park, Hooked on Fish Chicago. You know where the fish came from. It's been sustainably raised, and it's better than whole paycheck fish. I'm all in. I'm ready. Look that fish Chicago. Whole paycheck uh, fish got bought up by Amazon. Well, it looks like someone else is going to ch challenge it. But let's keep going with the cannabis reform. Yes. Uh, because I know that you and I had had discussions around medical marijuana and legislation. And then uh, the next thing I know, I don't know where I was when it happened, but you and State Senator Heather Staines both introduced bills in your respective uh, legislature or houses mm -hmm. and uh, for the legalization of marijuana in the great state of Illinois, the prairie state. Absolutely. It is time for adult use here in Illinois. Um, so where are we at on that? So we are, we're playing the long game here, right? We want to do this right. We are um, likely or possibly going to be the first state to do it by legislation. Every state that's done it so far has done it by ballot initiative. Um, which allows for speedier reforms, but not necessarily really well done legislation because you don't have the same deliberative process go into the creation of a ballot initiative that you do go into a piece of legislation. Just let me ask, yeah. why don't, didn't we ever get it on the ballot? Uh, because we do not have a binding referendum That's here right. in Illinois. We, are okay. not, we, we have advisory referendums and keep, folks have asked me why don't we do an advisory referendum. Uh, the reality is it would take as much work to pass a, a bill to put an advisory referendum on the ballot as it would take to actually just pass the law. So I'm going to put my energy where it's going to be most productive. Um, and frankly, I think we know where the public stands. You know, the Paul Simon Institute for Public Policy Research released a, a poll, um, actually uh, kind of ironically, just a few days after we introduced our bill. They, we didn't ask them to do the poll. They didn't know we were doing the bill. We didn't know they were doing the poll. Um, that showed 66% uh, statewide in support of full legalization, um, showed some really interesting demographics in terms of, uh, you know, there is, there's not a partisan divide in terms of who supports this. There is not a, there, the, the demographics are amazing. Every age group is, is in support. Every political affiliation is in support. The only group that is not in support, the only demographic group polled that is not in support is evangelical Christians, which we would expect. Um, so it has, uh, it, it has incredibly widespread support, and I think that it really is a when, not if proposition, and it's, uh, you know, hopefully within, a, within the next couple of years. Well, if it's when, how soon when? What do you think? I think within the next couple of years. Um, you know, we have a governor who has not been super friendly towards cannabis reform policy. It took two bites at the apple to pass our, um, our, our ticket bill, our civil ticket bill. Um, he, he did a mandatory veto to try to make it a little more conservative. Um, and, you know, he's been resistant on the medical front. 
uh, you know, our medical uh, industry is struggling because we have such a small patient base. Um, it took a great deal of work to get him to allow some additional c conditions to be brought in, to loosen some of the restri restrictions on doctors recommending people to the program. So at the time last year when we passed the expansion, there were about 7,000 patients. We're now up to 22,000. So these guys are actually, these, the, the industry guys are actually able to you know, stay alive now for, uh, rather than just constantly running at a loss. Um, but the reality is, you know, they, they need a much bigger patient base. They expected a bigger patient base. Um, you know, it's still a drop in the bucket. By, you know, population standards, there's an, anti there's an estimate of north of 700,000 cannabis users in the state. Um, and we have 22,000 of them in our medical program. So there's a, there's, there's a huge untapped market out there. Before we go to a musical break and talk budget, um, what can people do to support this effort as you go forward with hearings and um, so we will be doing hearings around the state. I'm actually doing a, a, a forum in Peoria on, I believe, the 25th of July uh, with representatives Jahan Gordon Booth and Marcus Evans on the questions of um, criminal justice backgrounds and restoration um, for folks who want to be engaged in the industry um, because I do think that's a huge social justice issue we've got to deal with. Um, but we will be doing hearings all over the state. The most important thing people can do is make sure that their legislators know and that the governor knows they want this to be passed. You can go to safer, uh, saferillinois.org um, to, to get engaged in the grassroots effort or just send an email to my office at repcassidy at gmail.com, put legalization list in the subject matter line and we'll keep you posted and get you engaged. Um, I just, uh, as I noted before, I've been traveling and what I saw up in Canada where they have legalized it, uh, they're starting to be these kind of uh, uh, pop-up uh, drug dispensaries. And that in Ontario, not in, in Ottawa, uh, I was walking down the street and I saw a big line of people and it was a cannabis place that had been closed the first day they opened but they reopened right away and they haven't been touched since. Um, and then. We heard that uh, now Michigan, I think the legislature there is moving toward a new yeah. beyond medical marijuana to recreational use. And in the news right now, there is this stuff about Nevada, Republican governor, one Republican senator. Uh, but they're having a problem. They legalized it. Yeah. But they're having a problem uh, getting it out to all the people who want it. Yeah, I had to love this week. My, my phone was blowing up with the governor declaring a state of emergency in Nevada over um, a, a shortage of cannabis. And, and it cracked me up. Because they have to get it from within. Right, right, exactly. So what they did in their law, they, they, um, they created a distribution tier in their, pro in their program, just like here with alcohol. All over the country we have you, you, the, the, the yeah, like a restaurant can't go buy right. its liquor from a liquor store exactly. and sell it. You have to get it through a distributor. And, and the, the, the manufacturer can't go directly to the retailer. There's a middleman, that's the distributors. And so the distributor, the alcohol distributors actually wanted in on the process in Nevada. They got themselves into the law so that there was what's called a three-tier system. There's the manufacturer, the distributor, and the retailer. Um, but then none of the existing distributors, alcohol distributors, actually applied to be cannabis distributors in Nevada because of the, the federal law that could put at risk their ability to do alcohol distribution. And so there was nobody to get the, the, the cannabis from the cultivation centers to the dispensaries. They have plenty of cannabis. They just can't get it to the stores. So the state of emergency was actually, I mean, we think of state of emergency like, you know, natural disaster kind of thing. The state of emergency that the, that the governor declared was the ability to um, change those rules via an emergency process so that they could get other distributors into the, into the pipeline. Um, you know, we've been working with an organization uh, that's in states around the country doing work around this uh, called the Marijuana Policy Project. Right. And uh, they've been incredibly helpful in looking at things like this and, and being able to say, you know, when we talk about do we want to do a three-tier distribution system, well, let's look at what happened in Nevada. Let's see how we could do it differently. Having that 10,000-foot view with MPP has allowed us to take a look at everybody's revenue structure, everybody's regulatory structure, and find the best process that we can find for here in Il for, for Illinois. Now you think our governor though is going to uh, try and block this? Well he has not said outright that he's opposed to it, um, but he, but, you know, he's also done the whole my friend in, my friend in Colorado says it's, you know, zombies walking the streets kind of thing. Um, <laughs> so, you know, he, he's not friendly towards cannabis policy reform, as friendly as he is around other criminal justice reform issues. This is a, this is sort of a sticky point for him. So, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that we can get him to move a bit. Uh, but right now he is, uh, he's, he's not helpful. 
You're listening to Kelly Cassidy on Live from the Heartland and WLUW 88.7 FM. Let's hear a little bit of music before we move on to tax policy. That was Twin Peaks from one of their new singles, Tossing oh. Tears. Twin Peaks, fresh from their uh, Taste of Chicago appearance last week, are in London right now, tonight. <laughs> or probably right now. Probably. It's close to tonight in London right now. Um, Kelly Cassidy, our state rep, um, we've been talking about cannabis policy and Little League and a few other things. I want to talk about this budget compromise, if I can put it at that point, that might have some bills getting paid, but we didn't fix everything with this compromise. We still have a lot of unpaid bills. Yep. No school funding formula left yet, and really didn't deal with the pension crisis, which I remember when it was a ninety yeah. billion dollar crisis, yeah. and now it's approaching one hundred and twenty. What's up here? Yeah, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> <laughs> Just keep swimming. Um, so yeah, it is a compromise, um, and, and it's interesting because as I was trying to encourage some of my colleagues to take this tax vote. You know, so often I would get, well, tax votes are easy for you. You can vote for any tax you want. The reality is this isn't a big enough tax increase for my constituency. You know, our community has huge dependency on the, on the social service safety net, and a giant chunk of the unpaid bills are sitting in the agencies that serve our constituents. Um, and so it's a compromise for me, too. And, and reminding them of that, was it had, there were some interesting light bulb moments when I would push that point back at them. Yeah, yeah I can vote for a tax increase. But frankly, this isn't enough funding. Um, but it's what needed to happen right now. Um, you know, we, we had to, uh, uh, frankly, stabilize the patient and keep it alive um, because that's how bad things were for the state. Um, you know, working with some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who took this vote, who, who stepped out um, from, from their leadership and, and pushed uh, to get their colleagues to join them um, was really frankly, it restored a lot of my faith in, in humanity, seeing some of these folks who just wanted to do the appropriate thing for government. There was some bipartisanship we have not seen in a long time exactly. in the state or the country. Exactly. Fifteen members of the Republican caucus, the Republican House, House caucus, broke with leadership and took this vote. Not all of them voted for override because there was time to put pressure on them. Um, you know, the, the Illinois Policy Institute published some of their personal cell phones. They were getting death threats over the weekend between the, the tax vote and the override vote. So we did, we did lose some of them, which meant that Speaker Madigan had to, to put some targets on a tax vote, which is something I never thought I would see. I, I actually thought I'd see Republicans break with their leadership before I saw, before I saw targets take a tax vote. Um, so, you know, there were lots of unicorns. Uh, over the last couple weeks in Springfield. Um, but, you know, it, this was the step we needed to take now. We ne there's more that we have to do, and you're absolutely right. You know, the reality of the pension problem, first of all, the, the, the language that was used around, you know, shifting the, the ramp and that kind of stuff, that's the, that's the governor's language. You know, now they're criticizing it as not doing enough. That was, that was in his budget. Um, so, you know, it's really kind of Which cool. Which was higher than the budget. Well, absolutely. This is, um, this was... Uh, a good billion and a half less than his his initial proposal. Um, you know, three billion less than we were spending than the rate we were spending. And so, his wasn't balanced. And his wasn't balanced exactly. Um, so you know, we um, we this is a cuts budget. You know, and and it's it's more than a cuts budget because so much has died in the process. So you know, we're we're assuming a lot of that loss too. Um, and we've been doing cuts budgets every year since I've been down there. We've been closing facilities. We've been shrinking staff. We have um, among the smallest per capita government, state government in the country. People don't think that, but you know, we actually have a pretty lean state government. Um, so you know, but we're believing what the Policy Institute feeds to the Tribune that you know we're we're just you know throwing money into burning piles. And that's not the case. So how are you dealing with your left flank who doesn't feel like enough was done? As a taxpayer, I have a 40% increase in my property taxes from last year, 8% this year. Uh, Tony Preckwinkle wants to charge more for soda, which I don't drink anymore. Uh, but I have a lot of neighbors who do and are really upset with that nuisance tax. Yeah. Um, and I'm willing to pay the extra income tax because we were a couple years ago paying that. But You're actually paying a little bit more then than you are now. You know, 4.95, it's like a gallon of gas. You, yes. know, you got that nine on the end. But I, 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 I know that we haven't really touched the pension deal, which exactly. we need to figure out how to remortgage somehow right. uh, with a different revenue stream than we've looked at. That's probably a progressive rate that we will take three or four years to put into place. 
But what do we do in the interim when we don't really have enough to pay the bills we have now and we really haven't solved the longer term stuff? What should we be doing to try to encourage a more progressive, real, broad reform, uh, revenue reform package? So, you know, we did, we created the most progressive pro package we could under the, you know, restrictions that we live with here, right? You know, we expanded the earned income tax credit. We, you know, we, we put into play pieces that have progressivity at, at their base. Pro uh, progressivity. Um, progressivity. <laughs> progressivity. Um, you know, things that, things that I've wanted to do for a long time. We have a tax credit for private school tuition, a state income tax credit for private school tuition. I've wanted it to be means tested for years. I'd like to get rid of it. But at minimum, I'd like it to be means tested. We put that into place. So now, you know, folks who are at lower incomes will still get that, frankly, minimal tax credit. I think it's 250 bucks a kid or something. Um, but that's, you know, for someone who doesn't have a half million dollars or more in income, I think I actually did it at 250, um, then, you know, that's meaningful. The, the folks who, who are at that upper income bracket don't need that 250 bucks, frankly. Um, so we put that into place. So we inserted things where we could to, to make this tax um, more progressive. Um, but yeah, we need a pro progressive income tax. There's no question. The, the true fix to our revenue problem is full scale reform and we need a progressive income tax. Um, but the, the mechanics of that are, are lengthy and the politics of it are even harder. Um, you know, we would have to you know, pass a, a bill just to repeal the clause in our constitution that mandates the flat tax. Um, and that requires passing a bill with a supermajority in both chambers and getting it on the ballot um, uh, for a November election. So the next time we could do it would be November of 2018, um, but I don't see it happening under this, this particular political makeup. Um, so then you get it on the ballot and it has to pass with super majorities of the voters. And then we come back to the General Assembly to craft a tax policy, which is going to take at least a year. Um, so, you know, folks, I see folks out in, out in the community, why did you do this? Why didn't you just do a progressive income tax? Well, this is what it would take to do it. And then, you know, the curtains go down because it's, it's deep in the weeds. You know, we, everybody wants an instant solution. There isn't one. So I'd like to do some political handicapping here, if you don't mind, <laughs> starting at the state level but coming down to the city. Yeah. Are you going to run again as state rep? Yes, I am. And is there anything new you're going to bring into that campaign as we look at what the state needs and the kind of shifting political leadership at this point, this real battle between two guys who just can't come to much agreement between them? You know, I don't know if it's new, because I've always been, you know, I talked about how transparent I am with my kids. I'm pretty transparent with my constituents, too. Um, you, you know, I, I, I take the fight where it is, right? Um, when it's time to take on the governor, I take on the governor. When it's time to take on the speaker, I take on the speaker. Um, I might be the only thing they agree on, that I'm a royal pain. Um, what they the like you, though. <laughs> what are the governor's chances this next time around? I, you know, i got to tell you, this crazy town stuff he's done this week of, you know, outsourcing the entire state government to the Illinois Policy Institute, um, it's either just cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, he's going down fighting, or it's some sort of bizarre genius move that I don't understand yet. Um, I will say IPI is excellent at messaging. It's stunning to me how many um, IPI pass-through emails I get from our constituents who are... They're good at what they do. Right, so, so you know, they, 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 they create clickbait that people fall for. And so a lot of times at my events, I'll ask people, how many of you have ever clicked on an Illinois Policy Institute thing? And most of the hands in the room go up, like, do you realize you just gave your name and contact information to the Koch brothers? And then there's horror, you know, in the room. <laughs> um, and so, it, you know, that, but they're good at it, right? They're really good at this crazy stuff. Um, so I, who of the contenders, we have six now, yeah. uh, on the Democratic side, have a, the best chance of taking on this governor in the Illinois Policy Institute? Well, for my money, I am, uh, I, I'm 100% on Team Biss, or Skinny Math Man, as he's known on the social media. Um, you know, I just... Daniel versus the Giants. Exactly. Um, and, and that's exactly why I'm there, because I, I refuse to believe that the only way to <laughs> beat a billionaire is with a, another billionaire. I, I actually like a lot of the other folks in the race. I have good relationships with many of them, and, and you know, any one of them could do a better job than this dude. But, um, you know, ultimately, being governor is not your first government foray, frankly. And being governor trying to keep the ship from sinking really isn't. So I want somebody who knows where the bathrooms are in the Capitol. I want somebody who knows how to put together a team that knows how to 
you know, get stuff operating again. And that's why I'm with him. That's great. And I love your characterization. What did you call him? Math? Oh, Skinny Math Man. So there's, there's actually a, a really awesome Facebook page, uh, Daniel Biss Dank Memes. Um, and it's, uh, it's the, frankly, the fact that a, a gubernatorial candidate is cool with this is hilarious. Um, but it's a bunch of younger folks, younger than me, because I don't even know how to make one, um, who find these hilarious pictures and put funny slogans on them and put them up on this Facebook page, and um, they're a riot. And Skinny Math Man was a hashtag born of that group. Um, but he's now adopted it and has used it in some of his that communications, too. Yeah. Uh, I would uh, like to hear what your thoughts are on Madigan kind of uh, backing Pritzker already. I mean, uh, what's going on with this? I mean, Pritzker does not seem like uh, at a time when there's a lot of talk from the Democratic base about being more progressive, the most progressive of the candidates, but he's certainly got his foot in there and his money in the door, yeah. and he's tight with Madigan in some way. Can you expound upon that in a bit? Well, and I will say, I'm going to say some nice things about JB. I think his politics are pretty good, and I think he will embrace good progressive policies if he becomes the governor. That's good to hear. Um, that said, you know, this is where I go back to, I, I just can't embrace the notion that the only way to beat a billionaire is with another billionaire. And, and I think that for the speaker's part, maybe it's right from the position of speaker. You know, he's going to have to spend millions defending his targets. Um, and any money that goes into the governor's race doesn't go into defending his targets. So for him, it might be the best political calculation to get a little more money in the game. Um, and and that, that's not something to sneeze at, right? Like, it, I, I get it. Um, you know, he has said that he isn't openly supporting him yet, um, but, you know, all the, all the institutional support is going his way, which, you know, is usually a pretty good clue. Um, so I, I get where he's coming from on this. Uh, you know, he, he's, we lost, you know, we lost a few seats last year, and, and we're, we're poised to lose more this year, and, and the money is real and terrifying to people. Like, they, there's, the reason that that Republican caucus has stayed in line is that this governor has proven his willingness to, to burn money to punish people. I really thought that um, that uh, Chris Kennedy would make a better play this time since he seemed to be really in for a change after sort of floating sort of several times, about yeah. three or four times before. Yeah. But I'm really underwhelmed by him. Yeah, he hasn't really seemed to catch fire. I actually haven't met him, um, so I haven't had a chance to sort of gauge how he's going about it. Um, but yeah, he just hasn't seemed to get the traction. If he can stay in, you know, he, he probably automatically gets a chunk of votes just on name alone. And Pawar seems to have made some impression downstate, at least by the media coverage he's gotten. He's got a good rep. Yeah. Yeah. And he's very popular in the city. Do you think we hurt ourselves if both Pawar and Biss end up in the yes, primary we do. together? Yes, no question. Do you think something will get worked out there, or is it too sure. early to tell? I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's early to tell. I have to laugh, though. So I don't know if you guys have seen this website, like, Why Aren't Women Running or yeah. something like that. Um, Poir posted it on his Facebook page, and my first thought was, dude, the website exists to recruit a woman to run against you. Like, what the heck are you doing? He's you just know? the principal dude. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are no women in the race. Maybe, you know, maybe somebody will jump in. It's not going to be me. Um, you know. So I don't know that we've seen the whole field yet. Will Ron survive school crisis, the budget, and police reform challenges? I don't know the answer to that. Um, again, I mean, we keep seeing people come through in races they're not supposed to win, and then they win. So, you know, I, I, it's hard to say. I mean, good God, Trump got elected president. You know, Rauner won the election when we thought we were going to win. Rauner could win again. Anything can happen. I what think with gerrymandering, Trump could be in for eight years. God help Assuming us. he has enough patience to... I, I would bet against it. But um, what about you, young lady? What are your uh, young woman, sister? What's your plans in the future? I mean, you're going to be a state rep. You're running again. Chances are you'll win that. Do you see yourself possibly uh, assuming another position, whether it be the president, the Senate, the, the Congress? What's, your, uh, what's going on for you? You know, I just don't spend my life looking at the parrot on your shoulder, frankly. I mean, we got one in the neighborhood. There's, you know, a I know, on I, I know. I, I love Sharon and Lunch Monkey. Um, no, so I, I, I just don't. It's not how I operate, and I think that's weird politically. In my, in my world, it is weird. Everybody talks about what they're going to do next. Um, I'm doing what I'm doing, and you know, part of it is I, I'm not done, right? I like, I want to get this done. I want to get. 
I want to get cannabis passed um, before I think about anything else. This is, that's a that that's a hard line for me. Well, Kelly Cassidy, you're a wonderful interview. You're a wonderful person. We're so glad to have you as our state rep from the 14th Thank district you. here in the great city of Chicago in the great state of Illinois. And uh, we look forward to the ride home with you and going to see your son uh, pitch that uh, no all-star game. Go Loyola Park Dodgers. <laughs>